So we have two presenters today. We have Sarah Navarro. She's the statewide forest pathologist for the Oregon Department of Forestry. She provides technical assistance to private and state-owned lands on disease management issues, including being the lead for ODF's Sudden Oak Death Program. She joined the department in 2016 and came from the Oregon Department of Agriculture, where she served as a plant health specialist in their Sudden Oak Death Detection Program for plant and landscape nurseries. Sarah has a Master's of Science degree from Botany and Plant Pathology from Oregon State, Go Beavs, and a Bachelor in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and Fungal Biology and Ecology from University of California at Davis. And then our second presenter, who's going to sort of chime in about halfway through the presentation, is Norma Klein. And Norma is the OSU Extension Forester for Coos and Curry Counties. Norma works with small woodland owners on forest management issues um, related to forest health and management planning. She has a, a BS in forest management from UC Berkeley and an MS in forest management from Northern Arizona University. Norma started her career as a forester with the United States Forest Service and then spent 20 years with the Oregon Department of Forestry on the Coos District. So at this point, we'll just give our presenters um, a moment to share their screen and get that set up. It looks like your, your title slide. Yes. Yep. Okay, perfect. Great. All right. I'm going to we'll get started then. All so right. thank you. Thank you, everyone, for um, tuning in today uh, to hear about sudden oak death, both what we've um, historically been doing in the past and then kind of where we're at now, and then some new educational materials um, and outreach programs that Norma um, has been designing for the Southern Oregon coast. So I'm going to get started here and go through... Uh, so I'll, um, I'm going to go through identification of the disease and the pathogen that causes sudden oak death, uh, the quarantine regulations that we have to slow the spread of sudden oak death, and then the treatments that we're um, doing, and then after that I'll pass it over to Norma. And so what is sudden oak death? Um, sudden oak death and also remorum leaf blight, as we see in nurseries, uh, is an introduced disease to Oregon. Uh, it was brought in most likely in the late 90s to Oregon um, through infected nursery plants, most likely from California. It was introduced just outside of the city of Brookings and was detected through aerial survey in 2001. Um, since then, we have had a slow the spread program in Curry County to try to uh, slow the spread of this disease from infecting all of Curry County and then potentially getting into Coos County. And so sudden oak death is caused by the invasive, ex invasive exotic organism Phytophthora morum. Phytophthoras are part of a micro, they're a microorganism that's part of the group, the oomycetes. So they're a fungus-like organism. Uh, they they grow like a fungus, they look like a fungus, but they're not a fungus. They actually have cellulose in their cell walls instead of chitin. Um, and they also form different spores than our regular uh, fungi do. And so they, this slide shows um, both sporangia and zoospores, which are unique uh, to these water molds. And what um, they do is they, these zoospores and sporangia actually take advantage of water for their life cycle. And so the zoospores, have two flagella or tail on them, so they're actually able to swim through water. So they can swim through anywhere from just a droplet of water um, to a large pond as well. And so that part of their life cycle, actually, um, we utilize that in early detection for sudden oak death on the landscape. And so here in Oregon, um, in our Oregon forest, we have two lineages of Phytophthora morum in our Oregon forest. Uh, the North American lineage, or NA1, was initially discovered in 2001, and then most recently we've had a recent introduction of the EU1 lineage to our Oregon forest, and that was first detected in 2015. Um, at this point, the EU1 lineage is a top priority for us in terms of slowing the spread and eradication treatments, because uh, the European lineage in the United Kingdom is causing uh, dieback of conifer tree species over there, uh, commercial conifer tree species. 
they find it infecting their large Japanese large plantations. And so they've felled over 30,000 acres of Japanese large back there. Um, and then they also see mortality in Douglas fir, Porterford cedar, and western hemlock grown in close proximity to those Japanese large plantations. And so it's it's considered a more aggressive, the E1 is considered a more aggressive lineage than the NA1. And so what are the impacts of sudden oak death? So sudden oak death causes um, mortality to tan oaks and our Oregon ecosystems. And so tan oaks are a keystone species um, in our southern Oregon forest. They are the main acorn producer down there. Uh, they also acidify the soil um, and have uh, salamanders and newts that live underneath. And then in this photo, you see there's this creepy deer. Uh, and he is dependent on the acorns that are produced by tan oak trees. And so there's also, in addition to the impacts to our tan oak ecosystems, there's also cultural implications to sudden oak death. Um, tan oak acorns are, have been utilized by the tribes for centuries, um, as well as tan oak bark was used as a leather uh, tanning agent. Um, and then in addition to those impacts, there's also economic impacts. So there's shipping restri restrictions, both domestic and international. Um, and then there's the potential for a loss of markets from this disease. Um, so there's other countries that won't take uh, material from Curry County because of the presence of this disease. So there's the perception of the spread of the disease that could occur and also foreign regulations that are out there. Um, and then for, our, for, for Oregon, we're trying to slow the spread of the disease. And so we do have quarantine survey requirements. Um, and some of the, the survey itself does not come at a cost, but there is a cost to um, additional protocols that some landowners have to do in order to harvest from infested areas. And so Phytophthora morum thrives in Oregon's wet coastal climate. As I mentioned um, on the third slide, it's a water mold and so it thrives in those moist conditions, um, which we get a lot of our, on our Oregon coast, especially our southern Oregon coast. Um, not only do we have wet winters, um, but we also have foggy, moist summers down there as well. And so it spreads long distances in during wind and rain events um, down in Curry County. And so those spores that I showed you on the third slide, those are produced on the upper canopies of these infected trees, and they get blown off during wind and rain events to go and then infect new tan oaks um, further down. And so natural infection can happen um, up to four to five miles away um, from an infected tan oak to a newly infected tan oak. And so in addition to um, long distance dispersal of this disease, we can also have local intensification. Um, so if you have a single infected tan oak in a stand, uh, you can also get those spores raining down from the treetop, from that treetop onto the shrubs below and then onto the forest floor. And so the way that sudden oak death eventually kills tan oaks is by the spores being washed down the stem of the tree and then forming a stem girdling canker around the bowl of that tan oak. Um, and then also the spores can be dropped onto the forest floor where they can reside for many years and then they can also be washed into the stream courses, uh, which we take advantage of that for early detection of this disease. And so from the time of initial infection of a tan oak to the time when a tree becomes girdled and died, it can take anywhere from one and a half to two years. And so for our Slow the Spread program here in Oregon, we're really trying to we're trying to find those infested trees before they turn brown so that we can um, locally eradicate the disease from spreading further. And so this, um, this disease has the potential to spread into Josephine, Douglas, and Coos County um, based on risk models that have been done previously. And so the the biggest driver of risk for our Oregon forests is the abundance of tan oak on the landscape. So as you'll see in this map here, um, the very high risk is in Curry County where we have the most abundant tan oak on our landscape here in Oregon. 
And so what are the hosts for sudden oak death? Um, I mentioned tan oak earlier, and it's our most important uh, host species for sudden oak death in our Oregon forest because it because the disease can sporulate and spread from these host plants. And so there we um, call tan oak a bull host because the spores wash down the bowl of the tree and then go on to infect the bowl of the tree and cause that stem girdling canker. Um, other bull hosts in Oregon are California black oak and Canyon live oak. We haven't seen any natural infection of either of those two, either of those two species because uh, the disease hasn't made it into their uh, natural range as of yet. Um, other plants um, are all in the heath family that we have in our Oregon forests. And so we have rhododendron, um, huckleberry, both red huckleberry and evergreen huckleberry, uh, salal, madrone, and then lastly, um, azalea as well. And then um, manzanita, they've seen that infected in California. And so this, um, this disease has a broad host list. So there are over 100 plant species on the USDA APHIS host list for this disease. Um, but here in our Oregon forest, tan oak is the main driver of the disease on the landscape. And so true oaks, um, as I mentioned, so we have two true oak species here in Oregon that are susceptible, um, both the California black oak and the Canyon live oak. But what's not susceptible is the Oregon white oak, and they've done lab tests to determine this. Um, so how can you how can you prevent the spread? How are we preventing the spread in Oregon? And so since the initial introduction in 2001, um, the disease has spread eight miles east and 18 miles to the north in Curry County. And so currently we have a partial county quarantine in Curry County. So we've been able to contain it to one county here in Oregon, as opposed to California, where uh, they have 15 counties that are wholly quarantined for this disease. And so part of, part of our slow to spread program is this state quarantine. And so under the state quarantine, um, it limits the movement of infested material out of infested sites. So you cannot take tan oak that has been infested with sudden oak death off of a site. Um, it also puts harvesting restrictions on tan oak within the quarantine area, which is the um, yellow dashed line there. So in order to harvest out of the quarantine area, um, landowners have to request a, a disease-free exemption from our state quarantine. Uh, it also requires a log washing of non bull hosts um, like Douglas fir from um, known infested sudden oak death areas. And so right now that special exemption, um, the Oregon Department of Forestry works with the Oregon Department of Agriculture um, to do disease free surveys on landowner properties uh, free of charge. And so another part um, of the quarantine is we restrict the collection of host plants or host parts from soil from the forest. <laughs> um, and then also leaving infested areas, um, cleaning and disinfecting equipment. Um, as I mentioned, uh, log washing is another part of that as well. And then, so this is, uh, we have established procedures for um, establishing pest reproduction sites. So we still, we try to work with local landowners to ensure that they can still harvest um, timber from their property and maintain and go through their forest management plans properly. Um, but we want to ensure that they're not spreading disease through their logging activities. And so what are the symptoms of sudden oak death? So what do we see? on tan oaks um, and other plants. So on, on tan oaks, when we see um, vegetative sprouts or twigs or branches, uh, the main symptoms we see are twig lesions like you see in this photo. So the blackening of the stem and the distinct difference between um, the necrotic black tissue and the green healthy tissue. So right at that, what we call the disease margin. Um, on the trunks of tan oaks, uh, we see bleeding sap, and so it's typically a dark red color. Uh, sometimes the rain will wash away the sap, and you'll just see a darkening of the 
bark on the bowl of that tree. And then once you cut back the bark, um, you'll expose the canker that's been formed by uh, the by Phytophthora morum. And so this is all uh, diseased necrotic tissue. Uh, and in order to verify that sudden oak death or that Phytophthora morum is the cause of this canker, um, we sample right at that canker margin for, from the transition from disease to live tissue. And so um, when we're going out in the field, we're cluing in to these bleeding cankers on the bowls of trees. We're hacking back the bark just a tiny bit. And then we're actually plating um, disease tissue out in the field on Petri plates directly out there, um, trying to use sterile technique as much as we can. So lighting, or so using um, alcohol and lighters to sterilize our um, tweezers and knives out in the field. And then those uh, Petri plates get sent to Oregon State University to verify the presence of sudden oak death because there are other Phytophthoras, native Phytophthoras to our Oregon forests that do cause similar looking symptoms. Um, so everything has to be lab verified. And so this is a great uh, example of what, what we would see in the field. So you see these small bleeding um, canker spots on the outside, and then just gently scraping back the bark, we see those uh, cankers underneath. Other symptoms we'll see in the field uh, on rhododendron is we'll see darkened petioles and midribs. And then um, also wet leaf spots. So it almost looks like the the leaf in this case has just sustained a moisture for a really long time. So it's kind of made it softer and more pliable, but that darkened spot right on the leaf is where we would sample for sudden oak death. Um, and so as Brooke mentioned in my, my bio, uh, Oregon Department of Forestry is part of Oregon's interagency sudden oak death program. So I work alongside with the US Forest Service BLM, Oregon Department of Agriculture, Oregon State University, and most recently the Association of Oregon Counties um, to manage an interagency sudden oak death program for Oregon. And our program is compi comprised of five parts, which is survey and detection, uh, delineation of infected sites, treatment of infected sites, regulation and education, and then lastly, monitoring and research for this disease here in Oregon. Um, and so surveying for the disease and treating high infected sites are our main priority. And so for surveying for the disease, um, we five, fly four helicopter surveys every year and one fixed wing survey uh, to identify new red and dead tan oaks on the landscape. We individual, during the helicopter surveys, we individually GPS each point from the helicopter and then we then go and ground check those points um, to see if the mortality of the tan oak was caused by sudden oak death because there are other um, mortality agents out there. We find armillaria killing tan oaks as well, or as I mentioned earlier, other phytophthoras. Um, once we find an infested site, we then treat if it's a high priority. So we're trying to, our interagency program, uh, the goal is to slow the spread of this disease. We have, we've kind of reached past the point of total eradication here in Oregon, but we can at least slow the spread of sudden oak death um, from reaching the entirety of the tan oak on our landscape. And so for treatment of the disease, we pick the high priority sites or at the perceived leading edge of the disease for treatment. And so treatment involves host removal of tan oak from a site. Um, so if you think of pa plant pathology 101, the disease triangle, you have the host, the pathogen and the environment, and you need all three to have the plant disease. And so for sudden oak death, the only tool that we have in our management toolbox is the removal of the host from that equation. And so we um, remove all tan oak within a specified radius of one infected tree, um, because as I mentioned earlier on, it could take one and a half to two years for a tree to die from sudden oak death. And so we, we don't know if the adjacent trees to that single infected tree are infected, and so we'll remove them as well. Um, and so our ideal treatment is a 300 foot radius around an, an infected tree, which equates to about six acres on the ground. Um, and it can go up to 900 uh, feet radius as well. And so from the very beginning of our program, we have now treated um, 6,700 acres for this disease in Curry County. So with that, I will turn it over to Norma. 
All right, folks, just hold on one second. We're just going to um, have folks switch their presentations here. So I'm going to stop that sharing, and then we'll let Norma pull hers up. Yes, smooth. She's got this down. All right, Great. take it away. Well, super excited to talk about this subject. So I'm Norma Klein, and I'm going to talk about planting options in sun, sudden oak death areas and um, effectiveness of management strategies, and also go into our new citizen science project. So um, I get this as the extension forester in this area, I, I always get lots of questions about um, what, what we should plant and what we can do about this disease. So what should you plant if you are in or near the Sun Oak Death Quarantine area? Well, that depends on your location and your management goals and your tolerance to risk. So the riskiest choice would be to plant a uh, host that is known to sporulate the disease near an, a known infested site. And so um, those risky choices would be things like azalea, rhododendron, and, and tannic. All those are known um, sporulators. And so the, the least risky choice um, planting near a known infested site would be to plant a non-susceptible susceptible species. And I'll go through a list of our native plants that we know not to be susceptible to sudden oak death in a moment. So also, while a number of native plants are on the USDA host list, not all of them spread the pathogen through sporulation. So for example, Douglas fir and redwood are considered hosts, but they do not spread the disease through sporulation. So all of these factors you know to consider. Um, so for restoration planting and wild landscapes it's really important to keep container plants in a holding area away from other landscape plants for eight weeks to make sure that they're not showing any symptoms of disease and this is a really good idea for the home gardener also. Um, and of course, as always, we need to select the right species for your site. So you make, make an assessment if you have a shady, moist site or a sunny site, and try to select um, plants that are grown from seed from your uh, specific seed zone, are all, always the basic concepts. And so um, the, this is the list that we have of native plants that are not susceptible to sun oak death. Um, alder, al al Alnus rubra, is a great choice. It's a fast-growing hardwood that uh, does very well on moist uh, soils and um, pretty good sites. And it's a nitrogen fixer, so it's a pretty, um, pretty great choice. Um, shore pine, Pines contorta variety contorta, that's found naturally um, near the ocean on boggy areas and sandy areas. And it's a, it's a pretty tough plant that's also dis, uh, resistant to sun oak death. Um, Port Orford cedar, Chemicyprus larsoniana, is another choice, but unfortunately it's susceptible to another pathogen um, that's related, um, Phytophthora lateralis, and so we um, recommend that you only plant disease-resistant Port Orford cedar, but it is resistant to the um, uh, Phytophthora remorum. Uh, Western cedar, Thuja plicata, is, is another great choice. It does well along streams and in, uh, near springs and moist areas. And chinkapin, Chrysolepis, Chrysolepis chrysophylla. Now we have an asterisk next to this one because in California um, it is um, found to be a host, but it's not thought to be a, a 
it's, or it's thought to be a low risk in Oregon. And so what we're trying to do is find um, plants that have similar ecological function as uh, tan oak. And so chinkapin is a mass producer. Although the caveats are, it's uh, difficult to grow from a, um, to replant this species, so, so probably planting from seed would be the best choice. Also, it's a very slow growing um, species. So in terms of shrubs, um, ocean spray, um, holodiscus discolor um, is a uh, is a great selection. It grows in a variety of, of site conditions and it's uh, very hardy. Um, red elderberry, Sambucus racimosa, is another great choice. Um, it um, can grow along uh, streams and along margins and can be great for bank stabilization and restoration purposes. Uh, coyote brush, Vacaris pilularis. Now this shrub is tough as nails and can grow in uh, very dry sites and rocky conditions. Um, so, so that, that was our, um, short list, probably not, not complete, um, of, of the plants that we know that aren't susceptible to sun note death. And so now I'll talk about the, um, the effectiveness of our, of our known management strategy, strategy. So sun note death scientists are working hard on finding cost effective, um, and, um, effective strategies to combat this disease. And so as Sarah mentioned, um, piling and burning infested sites is known at this point is very effective because it's getting that sporulating foliage down to the ground and removing it. Um, but unfortunately, it's a very expensive um, management strategy. So folks ask me um, what are what other choices are out there, and so they um, I get questions of well, how about we we thin the stands, and this is not likely to be successful. Thinning is not likely to be successful because um, the retained tan oaks, if they are infested, would still be sporulating the disease. Um, so I also get questions about how about we harvest all of the tan oak in area to try to combat the disease. Um, well, that depends on uh, your management objectives. Um, some landowner, landowners are already harvesting tan oak because they compete with their crop species, but other landowners um, value their tan oak as, as important to ecological purposes. And so this option needs to be weighed carefully. Um, how about control burning? Um, well, kind of like thinning, um, control burning um, can be a great option for forest health or e ecosystem health. Um, but once again, since it's not removing the infested canopy, it doesn't prevent um, the, camp, the canopy of an infested tree from sporulating. So it's not likely to be successful. Um, how about chemicals? Well, there is some uh, more promise with some of the chemical applications. We have phosphonate, also called phosphate, phosphite that can be applied through um, injections into a bowl like on, on this um, photo or, or uh, through a spray application. Um, at this point, we are recommending uh, that this treatment would be used to help um, save important tan oaks in, all, in areas that are already um, infested with uh, the sun oak death, death disease. Um, because we're not sure if it is preventing infested trees from sporulating the disease. And so these are, these are options that are being um, uh, researched more. Um, so in terms of, of the, our other projects that we're, um, we're working on with the Sun Oak Death, um, we have a citizen science project um, helping to help with the early detection of sun oak death in Curry County. And um, we, we, last week, Sarah and I just helped um, our citizen science uh, landowners to, 
deploy bucket baits in the EU1 area. And so the premise of this project is that um, by placing um, buckets with a, uh, a bait leaf that's a healthy rhododendron and a healthy um, tan oak leaf under the canopy of, of a tan oak tree, if the uh, tan oak is infested, the spores will drip down into the buckets and infest the leaves, and the citizen science then uh, send the leaves to the lab at OSU, and they can be tested as an early detection measure. We also have a project in which uh, the uh, landowners can um, use a uh, rapid test for Phytophthora, and we're seeing um, if we can use these rapid tests as an early uh, screening mechanism also. Um, another project um, we're working on is um, the TreeSnap app, and this is to help um, us identify possibly disease-resistant tan oaks, um, primarily in the generally infested area. And so if folks see um, living tan oaks in areas that have been um, uh, heavily infested, then they, by taking a photo of the tan oak and answering some questions, um, the photo will geolocate the position of the tan oak. And, um, and by pressing submit in the app, it will um, give the information to Sarah and I, and we can um, see if it's a candidate to send the acorns to the lab for further analysis and possible resistant um, trials. And so let's see here. Oh, and so all of these, um, all of this information that Sarah and I have discussed is in the um, Sun Oak Death Prevention Recognition and Restoration booklet that's available on the OSU Extension Catalog. And um, you, that's, you can view that um, online or you can print it out as a booklet and that is all I have great well thank you so much um, Sarah and Norma let me stop sharing I'm just gonna stop sharing so it's just our pictures up there um, we do have a couple of questions and we definitely have time to go over them. Um, so I will send out a link to the how to get that tree snap app to all the participants after and then I'll also send out a link to the OSU extension publication so you'll have that um, especially you know for our master gardeners who might be fielding questions down in Coos and Curry and Josephine County this will be a really good resource for you. Um, so we do have a couple of questions and remember if you're thinking of questions, please use the Q&A and um, I don't know if the presenters can see that but I'll read off a, a couple of them to you and maybe you can do your best to answer things on the spot. I know that's tough. So um, if you need to take a pass from that, feel free to and then um, Sarah, you're on mute. So just remember that if you're answering. Um, so we have two related questions about the management. Uh, side. So you were mentioning that you're um, going in and you're trying to um, create the zone right around an infected area. Um, and so Skip is interested to know, like, since the spores, they spread so readily, what is that risk that's involved when you're eradicating? Like, how do you manage that risk when you're, you know you're going into that? Um, and then Kathy has a similar question. If you're um, have in, infested plants that have spores and now you're burning, are they then getting released, you know, out into the environment and then landing back down or further spreading that? So is, could you, one of you address that? Yeah, I can definitely address that. Um, they, that's a good question and it's a question we actually get a lot. And so um, the or cutting down the tan oaks and then burning them right in place is our best way to s stop the spread of those spores um, from going further on in the landscape. It's not a hundred, like there's still gonna be spores that are moving around, but we're trying to decrease the number of spores um, that are getting up into those upper air currents and then going further on. And so getting the trees on the ground and out of the wind courses um, lowers our risk of spreading the disease, but it doesn't bring the risk down to zero. 
uh, for the burning, there is a slight potential for the spores um, when the burning starts and when we light the pile right away, uh, there is the possibility that the pile's not hot enough and the spores could go up in the smoke column. Um, we don't know the effects of smoke on Phytophthora spores. It's actually something that both myself and my colleague, Jer Dr. Jared Leboldis at Oregon State University have talked about setting up a small experiment on that because there has been some new research coming out about um, smoke and fire and spreading of fungal and bacterial pathogens. Um, so that is something that we have talked about. Uh, Phytophthora spores are pretty weak, especially those spores that are um, produced up in the canopy. And so they, they die at 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we just need to get it up to that high and then they become, then they die. And so there is a, a very, there is a small potential for spread there, but just getting the tree on the ground and out of those wind courses um, is our best bet for lowering the risk. Yeah, Nancy had a, a similar question about wildfires. So we've had so many wildfires in the West. I'm wondering, is there any research into like the spread maybe of sudden oak death or of other issues through wildfire and, and smoke? There's been a little bit of research in the past um, from California. So in, 20, in 2008, the Basin Fire in, Big, in the Big Sur region in California actually burned half of their sudden oak death research plots. So they had a pretty good experiment of burned versus unburned down there. Um, and so that they, they did find that the wildfire risk was increased when it burned through areas where the trees had very recently died from sudden oak death. But when the trees were already on the ground, the wildfire risk wasn't any greater. Um, and they also found that um, the wildfire didn't do that much in terms of disease mitigation on the ground. And so we're also working with Oregon State University. And actually that photo that Norma showed um, of me out on a field site with burned stuff all around me. So that was, so we're doing eradication monitoring um, research down in the Checo Bar fire area. And so we're doing, um, we're collecting both soil and vegetation samples down there to see um, if we can still find the disease post Checo Bar fire. Um, so, so far they've actually been able to detect um, Phytophthora morum in the soil and vegetation samples in about half of the sites that got burned during the Checo Bar fire. Um, one thing to note, though, is the sites that we have for sudden oak death within the fire perimeter down there um, only burned um, at the low to moderate um, soil severe or soil burn severity ratings, and we don't have any sites within the high burn severity rating. Um, so that's ongoing research, and we're going to be working on that the next couple of years. Great. Um, so another question for spread when you were first mentioning this, um, that it's up in the canopies and then raindrops and it's raining down and it's in the soil. Um, it just made me think of like human spread. Like if mm -hmm. I was there and I'm hiking and it rained and now I have potential like spores on my backpack and then I walk through by the stream and now I have spores on the, sh you know, on the mud and my boots. Is that a, a way that this disease can spread? is like by humans or by vehicles or it's definitely it's, it's a possibility but we see it as a lower risk so norma earlier mentioned phytophthora lateralis or uh, porphyr cedar root disease and that's another invasive exotic phytophthora to our oregon forest and that's where in that disease for that disease um, spread on boots and vehicle and other logging equipment is super important for disease spread in there because it's a um, it's a root pathogen. So it's spreading in the soil and then infecting the roots through that contact with the infected soil. Uh, with sudden oak death, it's the spores up in the canopy raining down on the trunks that we really are worried about for spread. Um, so in so we typically see human like mud on boots or vehicles as a lower risk. Um, the U.S. Forest Service did have an infested site along the Redwood Nature Trail just outside of the city of Brookings, and they actually put down um, cedar heartwood chips on the trail through the through the eradicated area, so that if there was any remaining spores, 
um, the volatiles in those cedar wood chips actually um, kill the spores. And so they have done mitigation risks for that. All right. Um, a couple of questions. So this presentation really focused tightly on Oregon, um, but maybe you could just reiterate if you didn't cover it before, sort of where sudden oak death occurs globally, if you can. And I know we've heard a lot about like California, but is it uh, common in other areas of the world where? Um, so, sorry, Norma, I'm taking all these questions. No, 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 no worries. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have, so it is in, it's in Oregon. Um, we also have it in our Oregon nurseries. Um, so our Oregon nursery, our, the Oregon Department of Agriculture also does a survey and detection and eradication in some of our Oregon nurseries that are regulated for this disease. Um, there, it also occurs in two nurseries in Washington where they have a uh, eradication program. And then, as I mentioned, it's in um, 15 counties in California in their woodlands and also in California nurseries. Um, but other than that, we don't see it in other, or, and then we don't see it in any other wildlands in the United States. So it's only in Oregon and California um, in natural environments and other states, there's a couple states on the East Coast that are regulated for this disease in their nurseries. Um, and the USDA APHIS is in charge of that program around the United States. Um, they have done, they have done studies of other oak species in the United States and they have found that the oak species on the East Coast um, are highly susceptible to sudden oak death. And so that is one reason that we have this eradication program in Oregon is to prevent that spread of um, the spread of the disease to other natural ecosystems, um, which is, and it's why our nursery um, regulatory program is so important for that as well. Great. Um, so it sounds like there's a lot of phytophthoras that um, are, <laughs> yeah, so many phytophthoras. Um, so if, if, say I'm a gardener and I'm outside of these counties that we know have it in Oregon, but I see something that's similar, mm -hmm. what, what would you guys recommend that we do? Because there's probably a lot of mimics, right? There's things that have similar leaf issues or similar things, and then there's all these other phytophthoras. Um, what, what, I don't know, on the spot, if you could just say like a best sort of course of action of where people can go for help. I would say talking to your local extension agent. Um, they would probably know where to, if you suspect um, a Phytophthora or an invasive Phytophthora, the only thing that can verify that is laboratory testing. And so your extension agent is really gonna know the proper lab to send it to, um, and then the proper course of action and who to contact. Because uh, we actually, that's that brings up a, a really good point because we actually did have a master gardener in Astoria send in a sample to the OSU plant clinic and they had two landscape viburnums that were infected with remorum. And so the Oregon Department of Agriculture, um, when I was there, we went out and we sampled and they were, we took a an official regulatory sample, they were infected, um, we removed the plants and then we put down um, a soil amendment to treat the Phytophthora in the soil and then have since gone back and done monitoring there uh, because it was, it was a new find. And so that's, uh, that's an example of um, the master gardeners doing the right thing and, co and contacting the correct people. Great. Um, so a question for you, Norma, on um, the, your citizen science project. If someone, how can they um, get involved if they haven't heard about it already and they said, oh, I have a spot I could you know, help out with these bait buckets. Is that, what was their best way to, to reach you and um, get in touch? Yeah, that, that'd be great. So we're, the bucket bait project, and there's also, I, and I didn't really talk about this, a stream bait project that we're going to start in April. It's very similar to the bucket bait project that's just on, in uh, the little pa bait packets in streams. And they can, they can give me a call. I'm at the OSU Merle Point office. And, um, and let's see. Um, we're Is it limited to like certain counties or certain areas that you're yeah. targeting right now? Yeah, yeah. So we're focusing the, the bucket bait project and the stream baiting project to the area around the infestation 
um, zone, particularly to the leading edge, the north edge of the infestation zone. And so folks around uh, the Pistol River, um, uh, just near Gold Beach, uh, and a little south, they, they would be a priority for the project. But the TreeSnap app um, could be anyone in, uh, that has uh, tan oak in their area, um, particularly if it's infested. Okay, and so that app is just for, for tan oak, or does it work um, for any other diseases yeah, or issues? Yeah, the tree snap app has a number of other uh, uh, species that have disease issues. And so I'm, I'm just quickly looking at. <laughs> and we'll send out this information too. Yeah. I know we love like to play with things on our phone, and so that might be something fun for. Yeah, so um, um, tree snap app has um, American chestnut and ash and hemlock and and for each species if you get in, if you click on the species it talks about what specifically they're looking for the information they're looking for to collect right great um so if you just have time for a couple more questions um, so one was on, so most of our watchers are um, gardeners, home gardeners, and so you had mentioned that the, the nursery industry, and I don't know, I know you're in forestry, which is a different um, zone, but are you familiar with what is um, happening to sort of like protect our plant? Like or, Oregon has a huge nursery industry, um, a lot of plant materials moving. Are there um, similar types of quarantines in place around our nursery plants so that what we're buying is safe. Um, and uh, yeah, well, so I can speak um, to that a little bit. And so the Oregon Department, as I mentioned, the Oregon Department of Agriculture also has a survey and detection program for specifically for remorum. Um, but if you want to ensure that you're buying clean plant material, um, definitely check on the Oregon Department of Agriculture's website to make sure the nursery you're buying from is a licensed nursery. Um, any nursery that is regulated uh, for remorum won't appear on that list. So make sure um, the, the nursery is licensed. Um, as Norma mentioned, uh, just taking a look at all the plants you buy and looking for sim potential symptoms and quarantining those plants for at least eight weeks before you put them out there uh, in, uh, in, your, in your landscape. Because uh, the EU1, the EU1 lineage most likely came from a now closed nursery within the Pistol River area down there in Oregon. They've done molecular work uh, to show that it was the most probable source. Right. So we so know, so. yeah. So we know that stuff is coming out of nurseries and out of nursery stocks. So definitely, just buying clean plant material is really important. Great. Thanks. Um, so you had mentioned the um, cedar chips as a mm -hmm. A possible option. Do you know if anybody's studying that? So, you know, maybe like if a homeowner is concerned or maybe they have property that borders, you know, a natural area. Do you know of any studies yet that have, um, are looking at that? Yeah, there was a study, I think it was a while ago now, but by Manter um, that looked at the chemicals and the volatiles that that occur in the cedar heart chips and their um, and how they inhibit Phytophthora spores. Oh, great! Well, I'll see if I if that's something that's readily available, and I'll share it if if I can with the group. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a couple other questions, but they seem like they're pretty specific to a situation. So I think at this point we're gonna wrap up our webinar. You can't hear us all clapping, but I'm sure we're all clapping. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time. And again, all the participants, um, once the recording is available, I'll send out a link to the recording and then links to some of these, um, the app and the, um, the extension publication and other things that were mentioned. So you'll have all of that in one place. So um, just hang tight for a day or so, as long as it takes to process the, the video. And I just want to say thank you. And we'll see you. Um, our next webinar is not until March, March 15th. It's on grafting tomatoes. We're going to have an expert from Kansas State join us to show us and talk about grafting tomatoes. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, presenters. I appreciate it. Bye-bye.